Last week, I talked about two motivating examples, fluid flows and fields of force. In this video, I'll focus particularly on fields of force. I'm interested in describing force per unit mass of a gravitational attraction due to a massive object, but also force per unit charge of electromagnetic attraction or repulsion due to a charged particle. I'm going to dip briefly into some physics to motivate the definitions of this section. There are many ways to describe the force of gravity or the electromagnetic force. One of them is to describe changes in potential energy. Potential energy is a scalar that describes the state of an object with relation to other electromagnetic or massive objects. Stated in terms of potential energy, force is understood as the tendency for objects to minimize their potential energy as quickly as possible. That is, an object will move in the direction of greatest decrease. Thankfully, we already have a tool for describing the direction of greatest increase or decrease for a scalar field, the gradient. So the fields of force I want to discuss are fields of force that can be described as gradients of some potential energy. There is a name for these vector fields. A vector field uppercase F is called conservative if it is the gradient of some scalar field lowercase f. The lowercase f in this case is called the potential for the conservative vector field, mimicking the discussion of potential energy I just did for forces. Later, we'll have different kinds of potentials, so sometimes this is called the scalar potential to be more specific, but usually just saying potential is fine. That's a nice definition, and I'll get into the properties of conservative vector fields later in the week. For now, how do I check? If I have a conservative or a vector field, how do I know that it is conservative? Well, from last week, I know that the curl of any gradient is zero. Therefore, if capital F is conservative, its curl will be zero. It will be irrotational. This condition, zero curl, is necessary. But is it sufficient? Is it enough just to check the curl? The answer will be yes, but with some conditions. And to understand these conditions, I need to do a little bit more topology. One of the things that topology is concerned with is connection and separation. So let me go straight to the definition. A set in Rn is path connected if there is a parametric curve between any two points that stays inside the set. That is, I can draw a connected curve between any two points in the set. This is a good understanding of a set being only in one piece. If I can make paths between any two points, the set forms a connected whole. It is not separated into pieces. However, I need a slightly stronger notion. I want to be a set to be connected and not have any holes in it. This is also the domain of topology, so here are a couple more definitions. A parametric curve is called closed if it starts and ends at the same point, if it is a loop. It can have other self-intersections, it does not need to be a simple loop, but it must end up where it started. This gives me a technical version of the idea of not having any holes in a set. A set is called simply connected if all paths in the set can be contracted to points. Well, what is contracted? It means that the path can be shrunk in a smaller and smaller loop until it is just a dot. If all closed paths can do this, then there are no holes. This can be seen in an example. Here is a ring. If I draw a little circle in one part, well then I can contract this little circle to a point. However, if I draw a circle around the ring, I can't contract it without leaving the set. The ring has a hole in the middle so it is not simply connected. A circle, on the other hand, or a disk rather, on the other hand, is simply connected, since any path inside a disk can be contracted to a point. This lets me finish the previous question. If a field is conservative, its curl is zero. It is irritational. That was necessary, but not sufficient. On a simply connected set, it is sufficient. Any irrotational vector field on a simply connected open set is conservative. And this is how I will check. I will see if the domain is simply connected, and then I will see if the curl is zero. If both are true, the field is conservative. 
If a vector field is conservative, it is the gradient of a potential. I want to know what the potential is, where it comes from. So let me write down the components of the gradient. Capital F1 is the x derivative of the potential, capital F2 is the y derivative of the potential, and capital F3 is the z derivative of the potential. This means to solve for little f, I have to solve three differential equations. Thankfully, these are not impossible DEs. I just integrate f1 and x, f2 and y, and f3 and z. Each of these should produce the original potential lowercase f. The trick here are the constants. Since the first integral is an x integral, the quote constant of integration end quote might actually be a function of y or z. The x derivative would have destroyed anything without an x in it, so going backwards, I might have any function whatsoever in y and z here. Likewise, the integral of f2 might have any function of x or z added to it, and the integral of f3 the same for x and y. I have three equations for lowercase f for the potential, but I have to put them together to make a single function, or at least up to plus c, where c is an actual constant. A potential will always have this constant integration, which I will talk more about later. Let me do an example. Here's a vector field. Its domain is all of R3, and all of R3 is simply connected. If you calculate the curl of this field, you will get the zero vector, so this is ro irrotational. Since it is irrotational on a simply connected open set, it is conservative. It has a potential. I'm going to try and find that potential. To do so, I integrate the first component in x, the second component in y, and the third component in z. Here are those three integrals. The antiderivatives here are pretty reasonable, sine xy for the first two and z squared for the, for the last, but then there are all these constants of integration, these functions g1, g2, g3. I need to match all three of these up. Can I make a single function from these three descriptions? Well. For g1, I look at the other two equations. The second equation has the same sine xy term, so nothing new here. The third equation has a z squared, so maybe g1 is just z squared. I can use the same logic for g2. Maybe g2 is also just z squared. And then for g3, I look at the two previous equations. The functions of x and y that show up here are sine xy, so maybe g3 is sine xy. In this way, I can conclude that the scalar field f, the potential, is sine xy plus z squared plus c. This matches all three patterns. By setting g1 and g2 to be z squared and g3 to be sine xy and then adding the constant of integration, the actual constant plus c. So feel free to check that the derivatives of this f are indeed the three components of uppercase f. Here's another example. This is a polynomial field, so it is defined for all real numbers, and you can check again if you wish that the curl is zero, so this is irrotational. Irrotational on a simply connected open set means conservative, so I can look for a potential. I set up the three integrals, integral of f1 and x, integral of f2 and y, and the integral of f3 and z. All three are polynomial integrals, and here are the antiderivatives. Then I compare the pieces. In the first, I have potentially unknown pieces in y and z. In the other parts of the function, the only term, only the term y squared z squared involves y and z without x. So that is probably g1. In the second DE, I have an unknown piece in x and z. The other two have negative 4x squared z squared as the only piece without y. So g2 is probably negative 4x squared z squared. Finally, in the last, I need to figure out what g3 is. The other two pieces have an x cubed y as a function of x and y, so g3 should be x cubed y. In this way, I can make all three of these the same function by choosing g1, g2, and g3 carefully. The result is a potential of 3xy squared z minus 4x squared z squared plus x cubed y plus y squared z squared plus c. This matches all three equations for some choice of g1, g2, and g3. This is the potential, and again, it still does have some constant plus c. Let me return to the physics that motivated the whole section. 
What does this constant of integration mean? If a force is described by potential energy, then why does potential energy have an unknown or arbitrary constant? The constant of integration here reflects the fact that energy levels are arbitrarily set. Energy is relative to some arbitrarily base level. On the surface of the Earth, you can set potential energy be to be zero when something is on the ground, so that it can gain potential energy as it moves up. In a planetary system with a gravitational source at the origin, the convention is to set potential energy to negative infinity in the limit at the origin, increasing to zero as the distance from the origin goes to infinity. These are conventions for the calculations physicists do with energy, but they are just conventions. And this leads me to an interesting and important point. Energy is a fiction. In the mathematical models of Newtonian physics, leaving the subtleties of relativity and quantum mechanics aside for now, things like mass, charge, distance, and time are real fixed quantities. They mean something about the physical universe. Energy is not like these. Energy is a fiction we made up and set to an arbitrary reference level, because it leads to some very nice explanations for movement, i.e. objects accelerate to minimize their potential energy. Whether energy is positive or negative, large or small in magnitude, doesn't really matter to the system. There is no intrinsic energy. What is real is difference in energy, how much potential energy changes with position, how much kinetic energy changes with velocity, relative, of course, to some fixed reference frame. In the initial discussions on potential energy, you may have noticed some small confusion about increase and decrease. Gradients point in the direction of greatest increase. However, in the interpretation of physics for forces, objects move in the direction of greatest decrease. So there is a sign issue here that we have to worry about through this whole field. To account for the sign, the force will actually be the negative gradient. This is how conservative for forces work. They come from a potential, and the force is the negative gradient of potential energy. Finally, all of this also explains the term conservative. In physics, conservative means conservation of energy. Energy changes form but cannot be created or destroyed. Energy comes in two forms, potential and kinetic. A force causes acceleration, which will result in velocity, which is kinetic energy. The gain or loss in kinetic energy will precisely balance out the gain or loss of potential energy due to the movement. This is how conservative forces work. Now in the mathematics, conservative forces are the gradients of potential energy scalar fields. The only way to conserve energy is to have a force that is entirely derived from potential energy as the negative gradient. Everything about the force, the field, is right there in the potential.